congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we are gathered here this morning hour, we want to hear something that has been revealed to us in the Word of God, that is the story, if I may call it that, the story of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. It is a story, I trust, that is well known to each one of us, even our boys and girls. Now, you might know also that, that Martha and Mary reveal two different personalities. Martha was a server. Mary was a worshiper. And both in connection with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Martha was always on the go. Mary was quite happy to sit at the feet of Jesus. We know that story, don't we? Mary would quietly sit at the feet of one who would teach her. And Martha was the one that would always be busy serving. Now, the question can be asked, are both really believers? Mary, yes, we can understand that. Martha is what? Yes, undoubtedly. Both of them were believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. We know this from the conduct of one believer is more preferable, however, to the conduct of another one. We know, for instance, that the conduct of Mary, who sat at the feet of Jesus, was more preferable than Mary or Martha being busy with all kinds of duties. Well, now, nevertheless, here is what we have in the story of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Because we need to understand that even those who have learned to sit at the feet of Jesus are sometimes too long in just sitting there, if you know what I mean. Because even a person like Mary had to be called by Jesus once to get up and to go to him. Now, this is what happens with believers today as well. That we get to hear the call from Jesus to get up and to go to him. Even though we have learned to sit at his feet and learn from him. Now, we have such a call then here in our text. And I have as theme... The teacher has come and is calling for you. Now, I need to explain this theme for a moment, especially the term teacher. I checked the Greek Bible again, and there it says the didaskalos. And didaskalos means teacher, not master. Didaskalos, our English word didactic, comes from that as well. And didactic... Our students, no doubt, will know, means to be involved in teaching or to receive teaching. Didactic is teaching. And so what we have here is that the didaskalos is calling for you. So, therefore, I have as my theme, the teacher has come and is calling for you. In the first place, a loving call. Secondly, an encouraging call. And then thirdly, a moving call. Now, congregation, we know from the context that Lazarus, the brother of Martha and Mary, has passed away. He became ill, and soon after that, he died. <clears throat> and now, four days after the death of Lazarus, Jesus approaches the town of Bethany in order to visit Martha and Mary. And upon hearing that Jesus is on his way and getting close to town, Martha gets up and she goes out to meet him. That's, that, that's part of Martha's nature, you see. Because we read in verse 20, Martha went there, and, but Mary was sitting in the house. Mary was still sitting in the house. No reason is given to us why Martha went or why Mary stayed in the house. 
You could possibly say again, well, you see, that is the character of Martha to go right away when she heard that Jesus was coming, and it was the character of Mary to just stay put. Whatever the case, Mary, or Martha rather, meets Jesus and also dialogues, speaks with Jesus as well. But at a certain point, having talked with Jesus briefly, Martha runs back to the house and goes to Mary. Whether she whispers it in her ears or whether she says it, says it out loud. Anyway, it is said in secret, Mary, the teacher has come and is calling for you. Now, perhaps Martha took Mary uh, aside to tell Jesus that, to tell her that Jesus has come, or perhaps she whispered it in her ear. Nevertheless, Mary gets the good news that Jesus has arrived and that Jesus has called for her. Now, this is, first of all, as I indicated already, it is a loving call. Loving, first of all, because it comes from Jesus. Loving because we know already from verse 5 that Jesus loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus. Now, dear people, this is, this is quite remarkable that Jesus, the perfect, sinless Son of God, actually loves imperfect, sinful people like Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. And then I can tell you as well that Jesus has not changed. He has not changed. He still has that capacity to love imperfect, sinful people, even people like you and me. Now, brothers and sisters in the Lord, therefore, this is quite remarkable because you know, you know yourself very well, I trust. And you will no doubt be willing to admit right away that you are not worthy of that wonderful love of the Lord Jesus Christ because you know of yourselves also being a sinful person. The Apostle Paul said it of himself, the converted Apostle Paul, in me there's no good. And we too need to confess that regularly to the Lord God. But here, Jesus indicating that he loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus, he gives a very loving call to Mary. The teacher has come and is calling for you. Now, we do not read anywhere in this short passage in John that Jesus beforehand actually questioned Martha about Mary's whereabouts. We don't read that Jesus asked Martha, Martha, where, where is Mary? Will you please go and call her for me? We don't read anything of that at all. And yet, Martha understood that she needed to run back to the house and call Mary and say, Mary, the teacher has come and is calling for you. How, that, how did, did Martha know this? Because Jesus has come, you see. Jesus has come to them. And therefore, when Jesus comes to people, we have the calling to come to him. Let me explain it this way. For Martha, it was very clear that in Jesus' coming, it implied Jesus calling them. It applied calling Mary as well. And so Martha, without having any audible instructions from Jesus, nevertheless ran back to the house, back to her sister, and told her, the teacher has come and is calling for you. Martha therefore understood that in Jesus' coming, in Jesus' arrival, was implied a calling for us, for Martha Marian, to come to Jesus. 
I hope you understand it because I believe it's very important. When Jesus comes, it means that he calls us to come to him. It is therefore not only a loving call that has come from Jesus, but it is also a loving call that came from Martha for Mary. Martha had a loving, eager part of her in her, and she wanted Mary to know this. The teacher, Mary, the teacher, whom you have sat at his feet to teach you, the teacher has come. And he wants you, and he's calling for you. Now, dear brothers and sisters in the Lord, I may do the same thing, actually, as Martha did at that day. That day. And I may tell you that it is a loving call from Jesus. In love, I too may say to you this hour, the teacher, that is Jesus Christ, has come. And he wants you to come to him. He's calling for you. He has come by way of the word, as we have read it already from John 11. But Jesus has also come by way of the sacrament as well. The teacher has come in the very symbols of bread and wine. The teacher has come and he says, I'm calling you to come. The teacher has come and is calling for you. A loving call. Secondly, it is an encouraging call. Mary needed this call. She needed it. She's been through a very rough time, hasn't she? First, her brother's illness. Then, Jesus' delay in coming. And then, her brother's death and the funeral as well. And true, Mary had the privilege one time to sit at Jesus' feet and meekly and humbly learn from him. True, Mary had chosen that good part, so we are told as well, that preferable part of worshiping Jesus, of which Jesus said that cannot be taken away from her, Luke chapter 10. But that has not kept the difficulties away from Mary. It has not shielded her from sorrow or grief. At this point, we have no doubt that Mary is rather downcast, and that understandably so. And therefore, this call comes to Mary as an encouraging call. The teacher has come, calling for you, dear people. I must say that having faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is a wonderful gift of God, isn't it? A wonderful gift of God. But it does not mean that it will always be spiritual sunshine for you, even as the sun shines out there, outside. Clouds, perhaps even dark clouds, could appear on your horizon too someday in a spiritual sense. Having faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is a marvelous thing, but it does not shield you from difficulties. It doesn't keep you from getting into trials. In fact, temptations will come at you, perhaps even stronger than those who have no faith at all. As a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, therefore, you might sometimes also be downcast or sad or even sorrowful. And the Psalms also testify of this, don't they? We've, we've sung from Psalm 42, and you know those words, why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are disquieted within me? Discomfort. As a believer in Jesus Christ, you and I, we may sometimes meet with discouraging situations. Psalm 73 uh, speaks of that. For all day long, I have been plagued and chastened every morning. That's a believer speaking, you see. And perhaps you are also going through one of those down times, even now. And with Mary, you too are just sitting in the house, so to speak. Just staying in your spot. But to you comes that inviting call and is meant 
to be encouraging to you as well. The teacher has come and is calling for you. He is calling for you, you who perhaps are downcast, who perhaps are very sad and sorrowful, for you who perhaps find yourself in a very discouraging situation. To you the word comes. The teacher has come and is calling for you. The question is, are you hearing that call? And then lastly, let me say something about it being a moving call. This means that this call uh, that you may hear makes you get up and go and respond. We read, uh, for after our text, after Mary had heard what Martha told her, as soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. The word spoken by Martha, the teacher has come and is calling for you, did not leave Mary untouched or indifferent or unmoved. The call did not leave her sitting where she was sitting. The call did not leave her reasoning in some way that we sometimes do well. Is it really a sincere call? Is it really for me? Or am I really fit for this to go? No, the call moved her. It was a moving call. Mary got up and she went, and we we're told she went quickly. Why? Because it was Jesus who was calling her, you see. It was the teacher who told her, come to me. Why? So that she could be taught what it means to come to Jesus. And so not only was it a loving call, not only was it an encouraging call, but it is also at the same time a call that comes from the greatest teachers of all to teach her that this was the best for her, the best for her spiritual life, the best for her faith, that she would come. Dear people, the Lord's Supper is to be celebrated this hour and the Lord willing also this afternoon. And we know that the Lord Jesus is really the host of this table. The host of this table. He's the teacher who has come among us and he's now calling to you and to me. Do this in remembrance of me. It is a loving call because he loves you and he wants you to be near him and to have this meal with him. It is an encouraging call. Because whatever circumstance you find yourself in presently, whether you are downcast, whether you are troubled as you might be, it meant to encourage you and to lift you up and to teach you. It is a moving call. That is, it should cause you to respond positively and receive the bread and wine, which are symbol, symbolic of the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and to celebrate it with him. The teacher has come and is calling for you. The teacher, as you've heard, is what is meant here in this Bible passage. And that means that he is the one who will and who can instruct us who prefers that we worship him in obeying him, in listening to him, and do what he teaches us to do. And that is best for you and for me. The teacher has come and is calling for you. Therefore, do not hesitate, but respond to this call. And do that in obedience to the teacher. And that for the strengthening of your faith. I'm now going to read the form for the celebration of the Lord's Supper. Now, we read the first part of that form. And um, you can find it, page 137, in the back of your Psalter, which uh, addresses us again. So... The, Second paragraph, the top 
of page 137. Let us now also consider to what end the Lord has instituted his supper, namely, that we do it in remembrance of him. Now, after this manner, are we to remember him by it? First, that we are confidently persuaded in our hearts that our Lord Jesus Christ, according to the promises made to our forefathers in the Old Testament, was sent by the Father into the world, that he assumed our flesh and blood, that he bore for us the wrath of God, under which we should have perished everlastingly from the beginning of his incarnation to the end of his life upon earth and that he has fulfilled for us all obedience to the divine law and righteousness, especially when the weight of our sins and the wrath of God pressed out of him the bloody sweat in the garden, where he was bound that we might be freed from our sins, that he afterwards suffered innumerable reproaches, that we might never be confounded, that he was innocently condemned to death, that we might be acquitted, at the judgment seat of God. Yes, that he suffered his blessed body to be nailed on the cross, that he might fix thereon the handwriting of our sins and has also taken upon himself the curse due to us, that he might fill us with his blessings and has humbled himself unto the deepest reproach and pains of hell, both in body and soul, on the tree of the cross, when he cried out with a loud voice, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? that we might be accepted of God and never be forsaken of him. And finally, confirmed with his death and shedding of his blood, the new and eternal testament, that covenant of grace and reconciliation, when he said, it is finished. Secondly, and that we might firmly believe that we belong to this covenant of grace, the Lord Jesus Christ in his last supper took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. In like manner, also after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and said, Drink ye all of it. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you and for many, for the remission of sins. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. That is, as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, <clears throat> you shall thereby, as by a sure remembrance and pledge, be admonished and assured of this my hearty love and faithfulness towards you, that whereas you should otherwise have suffered eternal death, I have given my body to the death of the cross and shed my blood for you, and as certainly feed and nourish your hungry and thirsty souls with my crucified body and shed blood to everlasting life, as this bread is broken before your eyes and this cup is given to you, and you eat and drink the same with your mouth in remembrance of me. From this institution of the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ, we see that he directs our faith and trust to his perfect sacrifice, once offered on the cross, as to the only ground and foundation of our salvation, wherein he is become to our hungry and thirsty souls the true meat and drink of life eternal. For by his death he has taken away the cause of our eternal death and misery, namely sin, and attained, obtained for us the quickening, life-giving spirit, that we, by the same who dwells in Christ as in the head, and in us, his members, might have true communion with him and be made partakers of all his blessings of life eternal, righteousness, and glory. Besides, that we, by the same Spirit, may also be united as members of one body in true brotherly love. As the Holy Apostle says, for we, being many, are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. For as out of many grains, many one meal is ground and one bread baked, and out of many berries being pressed together, one wine flows and mixes itself together, so shall we all, who by a true faith are engrafted into Christ, be altogether one body through brotherly love, for Christ's sake, our beloved Savior, who has so exceedingly loved us, 
and not only show this in word, but also in very deed towards one another. Here to assist us, the Almighty God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, through his Holy Spirit. Amen. That we may obtain all this, let us humble ourselves before God and with true faith implore his grace. <clears throat> let us pray. O merciful God and Father, <clears throat> we beseech thee that thou will be pleased in this supper in which we celebrate the glorious remembrance of the bitter death of thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to work in our hearts through the Holy Spirit that we may daily more and more with true confidence give ourselves up unto thy Son, Jesus Christ, that our afflicted and contrite hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit may be fed and comforted with his true body and blood. Yes, with him, true God and man, that only heavenly bread, and that we may no longer live in our sins, but that he in us and we in him, and thus truly be made partakers of the new and everlasting covenant of grace, that we may not doubt, but thou wilt forever be our gracious Father, nevermore imputing our, great, our sins unto us, and providing us with all things necessary as well for the body as the soul, as thy beloved children and heirs. Grant us also thy grace, that we may take up our cross cheerfully, deny ourselves, confess our Savior, and in all tribulations, with uplifted heads, expect our Lord Jesus Christ from heaven, where he will make our mortal bodies like unto his most glorious body, and take us unto him in eternity. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Strengthen us also by this holy supper in the Catholic undoubted Christian faith whereof we make confession with our mouths and hearts, saying, I believe in God the Father, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe the Holy Spirit. I believe in holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. That we may be now fed with the true heavenly bread, Christ Jesus, let us not cleave with our hearts unto the external bread and wine, but lift them up on high in heaven, where Christ Jesus is our advocate at the right hand of his heavenly Father, where all the articles of our faith lead us, not doubting, but we shall as certainly be fed and refreshed in our souls through the working of the Holy Spirit, with his body and blood as we receive the holy bread and wine in remembrance of him. So far, the reading of the form. Now, congregation, a few announcements before we celebrate the form. As has been announced in the bulletin, that we celebrate what is called close communion, that means that it is mainly for the members of the congregation, but also for those who have spoken to one of the consistory members and received permission to attend the table as well. With that in view, uh, I have received a message from Pastor Hicks that he has interviewed a number of uh, our visitors. And... Um, I would like to, um, if I can, pronounce their names, because, dear visitors, we know you now by face, but we may not necessarily know your name. And so I would ask 
that when I call your name, that you would just briefly rise so that we know who you are. I hope that is uh, okay with you. And so, Pastor Hicks has given permits to the Fardes. Welcome. You may be seated again. The scaring gas. I'm hoping that I'm pronouncing it correctly. Right. Welcome. Craig Walters. Welcome. And Nathaniel Bigney. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. Uh, I'm told by Pastor Hicks that they are all members of good standing in Reformed churches and confess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Then I must also announce that because of the COVID thing, we are still uh, celebrating it in a rather restricted way, which means that you will just remain where you are. However, um, you will be asked to rise, or if you cannot rise, at least raise your hand uh, if you w wish to receive the bread and the wine. And Brother Wren and Brother Bert will then bring these elements to you. And while I stay here, and um, so I hope...